Australia is a vast and lucky land. Beneath our feet is a treasure trove of unimaginable riches. But this story is about much more than precious minerals and dusty mine shafts. For 150 years, mining has changed the lives of us all in unexpected and extraordinary ways. It sparked waves of mass immigration and ignited political revolt. The stockade is taken and 30 people are lying dead. They were the shock troops of Australian democracy. But mining has also toppled prime ministers. Their only job is to deliver a profit. And if that means that they bring the whole world down with them, then too bad. It's wrenched Aboriginal people's land away. Yet mining could be the very thing that offers the first Australians hope. What I've seen in my lifetime is the transformation of the mining industry from the pillagers to the major investors in the Indigenous world. It saved Australia from financial ruin and made people rich in the most unpredictable ways. There's always been a link between mining and prostitution. The promise for them was the same as the promise for the men. They got the gold as well. But this boom and bust business ignites raging clashes over who gets the money. The police came and they told us, you know, get out. They're going to come and they're going to burn houses. Mining's rich history is a battleground that has divided and yet forged the nation. It has an effect upon every aspect of our lives. So the story of mining is Australia's story. Power, land and money. This is the epic history of mining. and the small colonial town of Melbourne has caught a fever. Have you ever held a bar of gold? It's very heavy, but you somehow start scratching at it. You, you want to have some. It does have a certain magic allure about it, and particularly to people in the 19th century because uh, it was a way of getting suddenly rich, and it was legal. Word of mouth runs through the streets of Melbourne and its immediate suburbs that there's gold to be found, that there's wealth to be made, and it's in, within the reach of anyone who can get to the diggings as quickly as possible. Hundreds, thousands of people down tools, left their jobs, left their families, and headed up country. There's a premium on wheelbarrows, on blankets, on all sorts of paraphernalia to take to the diggings. By the time they get out to diggers rest and further up towards the diggings, the tracks are littered with the now unwanted paraphernalia of mining as people throw away all their encumbrances simply in attempt to get the diggings as soon as possible. Gold has already been found in New South Wales but the wealthiest gold fields in the world are within 100 miles of Melbourne. The precious metal lies just inches from the surface. And in their fervor to get rich, the thousands who come here tear at the earth, leaving it scarred like a battlefield. This is Australia's first mining boom, and the long fight to grab the riches has begun. If you arrived on a goldfield like this, you would look around and see 
what looked like to be the best spot. The further into the gully you went, the deeper the gold was going to be. The further back, the shallower, and therefore it was a bit easier to dig. The main thing was that if you marked out a claim for yourself, you had to be actively digging on it. You couldn't just be bagsing all these bits of land for yourself and not be digging on them. Gold could absolutely change your life overnight. And it wasn't just wealth. I mean, I think this is really important to understand, is that gold represented autonomy. It represented being your own master. It represented not having to work for wages anymore. So it wasn't just the kind of bucks in your pocket that was important, but it was the freedom and independence that the whole gold digging lifestyle represented. The fields may offer the chance of a golden future, but striking it rich is no sure thing. Mining is a gambler's game. Your chances of getting rich on a gold field would have depended really on three things. Firstly, whether you had any geological knowledge. On my reading, the vast majority of the people in the rushes didn't have. Your ability to work hard and persevere. And thirdly, having found something, you then had to keep it. You had to somehow dodge the, uh, the pubs uh, not get it stolen from you and there were some brigands around, a lot of the people were armed and so if you survive those three hurdles you got rich and uh, I don't know what the odds are, probably be one in every hundred or something like that. The odds may be long but the promise of vast sums of money brings a rush of humankind not seen before or since. Mining is shaping the fate of the nation and is now the catalyst for the first international mass migration into Australia. A multiracial land is born. Gold is a phenomenal magnet. It reaches really across the whole world. So people are coming not only from Britain and Ireland as they had before, but they're coming from North America, they're coming from Northern Europe, they're even coming from China. For every person already living in Victoria, another five arrive. Within a single decade, the gold boom will push the population to more than half a million. By 1853, Melbourne is the fastest growing city in the world, but it can't cope. You had people arriving so fast that there was simply not enough accommodation. So they begin to create new buildings. In the first six months of 1853, they built a thousand buildings in the central city of Melbourne. And then when they finally have no more accommodation, the authorities allow the building of a canvas town, a tent town, on the south bank of the Yarra, just to accommodate the sheer numbers of people who are coming. The sailcloth that powered the migrant ships is torn down and used as makeshift shelter for 10,000 homeless diggers. A vast campsite in Australia's first modern city. The nearest comparison was probably like a, a third world shanty town or favela. Poor water supply, poor sewerage. For many people, life was pretty grim. It was exciting if you made gold. It was exciting if you were on the way to gold and you had enough money in your pockets to make your way there. But if you'd come back and you'd run out of money, then it was a pretty desperate place to be. But in spite of what awaits them, the hopeful immigrants keep on coming and mining changes the face of a continent. Within a few short years, one in 10 Victorians will be Chinese and they'll make up a fifth of all the miners on the gold fields. One of them is a young and very ambitious entrepreneur by the name of Lo Kong Meng. Lo Kong Meng was a young trader operating throughout the Indian Ocean and he came straight over to try his hand on the gold fields, went up to the gold fields, stayed there for three months and didn't make much money. He then decided that he could make a lot of money by selling food, particularly to the people who needed it. They all wanted tea, they wanted rice, they wanted opium, they wanted alcohol. He could provide all those things from Asia. Mining is spawning business and trade needed to sustain it. A new, 
trickle-down economy is being created. And in the battle to claim a stake of Australia's new wealth, Lo Kong Meng is winning. He was also heavily involved in bringing Chinese miners out to Australia as well as providing them with foodstuffs. He realised that he could bring out the men, put them to work, provide their food and make money all along the way. He became one of the wealthiest business people in Victoria at that time and contemporary accounts regard his operations on a colossal scale. The mining millions are flowing into every corner of society. Melbourne is awash with cash. And when the sun goes down, the gamblers who've enjoyed luck in the fields are ready to blow their winnings. Friday night was the night out in Melbourne then as it is now. In the 1850s, it was possibly even wilder because you had vastly greater numbers of young men with money to spend, and there were plenty of places to spend it. <laughs> Cafes, restaurants, theatres, brothels, the whole range of pleasures were available to the young men who came back with money to spend. Gold worth more than $15 million in today's money is pouring into Melbourne every week. A new treasury is commissioned to store all the bullion in. Mining has created the fastest growing economy in the world. Did gold change Australia fundamentally? Sure did. And gold forces communities to ask this question. How permanent are we? How important are we? What's our place in a broader scheme of things? And if you've got gold coming in, if you've got money coming in, that's a very easy answer to give. We're very important. And if we're important, we do need a grand parliament house. We do need a city with boulevards. We do need to attract artists and writers and be patrons of cultural, civilised things because we have arrived. This is our place in society. The pastoral land of sheep and shearers is changing into a cosmopolitan country driven by gold. But in the rush for riches, mining ignites unexpected and bitter battles. Conflicts that will forge the laws of the land and spark a new era of racism. I think the racial hostility to the Chinese that the European miners expressed, which had many, many grounds, there were political grounds, they, they couldn't participate, there were moral grounds, they're accused of all sorts of vices, there are biological grounds, um, that they're racially inferior, all sorts of grounds for hating the Chinese. But at the bottom of all those um, arguments is that the Chinese miners did not have any right to share in the wealth of the country. the politicians of the day agree. The fundamental question of who deserves to cash in on a mining boom inspires the passing of racist laws. The Victorian government put a head or poll tax on Chinese coming by ship. And they also limited the number of Chinese a boat could take by putting a ratio between how many Chinese and tonnage. This was definitely racist legislation. It was singling the Chinese out. It was very draconian. And when one looks at it now, one says that it's hardly believable that this actually happened. Victoria may be slamming the door shut on the Chinese but they are a people willing to go to extraordinary lengths to win the battle for a cut of Australia's mining millions. From 1855 to 1857, more than 15,000 Chinese migrants sail here to the tiny fishing village of Robe in South Australia. In distinct single-file formation, 
they walk more than 500 kilometers to the gold fields, avoiding the Victorian immigration authorities. One of the men is Ross Lingui's great-grandfather, Gui Ling. My great-grandfather had no idea what was in front of them when they got off the boat and started the march. The journey would have been terribly hard, you know, not a, not knowing where you were going and walking through the the, um, the Mulga area in, in Victoria, the, the scrubland, the, the harshness of the ground and the, just basically the bush conditions that we have. There's a lot of uh, parts where the land is very arid and dry and consequently they sunk a number of wells in their journey along the way so that the people coming behind them um, had water to drink along the way. But Ross's great-grandfather and his fellow countrymen are heading for trouble. Tensions between the white diggers and the Chinese are reaching breaking point. The fight for the mining money is about to explode into a race riot. By the beginning of the 1860s, gold worth $18 billion in today's money has been dug from Australia's rich earth. But fears are growing that the boom times are about to end. So news of a strike at Lambing Flat in New South Wales sparks a rush of desperate European and Chinese miners. Once again, the battle is on to seize a share of the mining money. I think for the miners who are struggling to keep being miners, um, it's really important they want to stay on the gold fields, they want to keep earning money. So they really resent the arrival of large numbers of Chinese who are going to compete with them for this gold. I think racial hatred has many grounds, and there are many reasons for it. But it comes to a head, really, when people are in conflict about money. As night falls on the 30th of June, 1861, an angry mob of 3,000 European diggers set upon their Chinese rivals. Lambing Flat will become one of the most disturbing race riots in Australia's history. The European miners gather and they're determined to drive the Chinese off for once and for all. They have a banner which says, roll up, roll up, no Chinese. It has a Eureka flag in the middle, so it's directly aligning the anti-Chinese cause with the sort of Australian democracy cause, and they then march. Going to the Chinese camps, gathering their belongings, the belongings are put in bonfires and burnt. They cut off their hair, their pigtails. Sometimes they pin them to flags, it's like trophies, and they drive the Chinese away. They were just on the rampage, really. They were able to go from Chinese camp to Chinese camp to Chinese camp and drive people away by whatever means that was necessary. It takes two long weeks for the police and government troops to finally restore order. But the state politicians know they must act. Ironically, the solution to a race riot provoked by money is yet more racist legislation. The anti-Chinese riot at Lambing Flat seriously worried the government in Sydney. They weren't so worried much about the Chinese, but they were worried about the disorder on the gold fields. There were very few troops in the district and they were worried about an outbreak of rebellion. The European miners win. Even though the violence that they engaged in is condemned, they got what they wanted. They got restrictive legislation um, in terms of immigration and they got a different management of the gold fields, which made it much easier to keep Chinese away from particular gold fields. So, they won. The Chinese Immigration Restrictions Act is a direct response to the Lambing Flat riot. A conflict between miners and a fight for the mining millions 
has sown the seeds for one of the most infamous immigration policies the world will ever see. Well, the irony is that this was an opportunity through having so many different cultures coming to the one place that could have created a multicultural Australia. It was a head start to a multicultural Australia. And yet instead, through the conflict born of being in such fierce competition and having the Chinese do better than their white counterparts, it ended up feeding racism and xenophobia in Australia that spilled over into the white Australia policy that went on for another 50 years. By the mid-1860s, in places like Ballarat and Bendigo, and right across the eastern states, the surface gold has all but disappeared. The boom could be over. But the very fact that Australia's treasure trove of minerals is now locked deep underground is the catalyst for a dramatic new era that will have repercussions for generations to come. The big money mining company has arrived. Alluvial mining dies hard in Victoria, but it dies and it's replaced by different sort of mining. Mining that needs capital, mining that needs companies, mining that needs infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure to get down to the deep leads or the, the quartz reefs in which the, the gold is embedded. They needed more capital to do this, so they started forming syndicates, then they started forming companies, and then they started trading in the shares. Well, what it means is that, first of all, you have all the individual prospectors jostling, competing for gold, and then the companies move in, but it doesn't become the classic capital versus labour thing because a lot of the miners are able to invest in the companies. They have their shareholders, they're looking for their dividends. There was this sense of common purpose. Everyone wanted to make money. The diggers can buy shares in the company they're working for and get a slice of the new corporate wealth. Gold fever becomes share fever. Local stock exchanges spring up in mining towns from Victoria to Queensland. The rocky relationship between mining and the share market has begun. By that time, we'd broken loose of being a convict colony. We wanted to prove, I think, that we were as opposite as possible to the regulated beginnings of Australia. And, uh, yeah, everybody had a chance, but you had to be in it to win it. It was pretty well all insider trading, if you like, because uh, they traded uh, amongst themselves. Uh, some people would know that there'd been a, a strike over the hill at uh, block number 121 or something like that, and they'd rush out and buy the shares. Other people would sell them. It was what they did of a night when they weren't drinking. Uh, if they did it when they were drinking, they had a problem. The rise and rise of the corporation during the 1880s means that mining and stock market gambling become synonymous. Even the birth of what will become the richest mining company in the world is decided on the turn of a card. Broken Hill was originally founded by a syndicate of seven guys, but uh, none of them had much money. And so to raise the capital necessary to keep on testing and assaying the ore, uh, they had to uh, traffic a bit in the shares and sell bits and pieces to people. The most expensive card game in Australia's history was a game of euchre, which was played between McCulloch, the station manager, and a, uh, a stranger passing through over the price of a 1 14th share in Broken Hill. That was whether it was gonna be 120 pounds or 200 pounds. The stranger won, so we got 1 14th of Broken Hill for 120 pounds. In 1885, the news syndicate float their proposition as a company. Broken Hill Proprietary is formed. BHP. In today's money, that 114 share would be worth around $12 billion. As the boom times begin for BHP, the money created by gold mining has already been invested in property and built towns right across Australia. The jewel in the crown is Melbourne. 
marvellous Melbourne. A city that is the envy of the world. But now, the children of the Gold Rush generation want to get in on this property boom and make a killing of their own. Many of them, of course, want to emulate their fathers. They want to make a pile of gold as well, and some of them, of course, do so, not through gold, but through land speculation. People were getting on the trains and they were making their way out to land sales on the edge of the city. And in the city itself, the speculators were spilling out of the stock exchange and onto Collins Street where they were exchanging paper and doing deals in the open air. But in just a few short years of rabid speculation, this mining-inspired boom of the 1880s becomes a devastating bust. If mining helped build Melbourne, then mining helped. Uh, to break it as well at that point because there was too much money around and we didn't know how to handle the thing. You know, modern parable, uh, but a hundred and something years ago, we had a version of the GFC and it was a big bust. If the same thing were to happen today, that would be equivalent to say, all the small banks in Australia and two of the big four closing their doors and saying, you can't get your deposits back, you've just got to whistle for your money. You can imagine the upheaval that would cause in society. That's how big the 1893 bank closures were. It's a volatile cycle that will be repeated in the years to come. Mining provoking rocketing booms that turn to crushing busts. But as the eastern states sink into deep depression, the latest twist in this roller coaster journey is about to begin. Mining's next boom will rescue Australia from economic ruin. Eighteen ninety three, and New South Wales and Victoria are gripped by recession. But in amongst the misery of the East, there's suddenly hope to the West. Gold has been found beneath the parched earth of Kalgoorlie, 600 kilometres east of Perth. Australia has a two-speed economy, and the rush is on again. I think there was a combination of hope and despair. People were, were desperate for work, so they were forced to come. But there's also that allure that gold offers. Um, the, the prospect of a fortune to be won. You either landed in Fremantle, and that meant it was a walk of 600 kilometres to Kalgoorlie, or you might have got off on the south coast at Esperance, in which case it was only about 350 or 400, but um, there is a kind of stagecoach service for those who can afford it, but most of them walked or they pushed their wheelbarrows. And uh, the great thing was to find a mate that went with you so that if you had an accident or fell ill, there was somebody who could look after you. These are no fly-in, fly-out workers, but they come in their tens of thousands from the east, desperate to grab a share of the new mining money. This second great gold rush not only makes WA rich, it props up a depression-ravaged nation. Mining is forging Australia's first single economy. A lot of the miners who came to Western Australia sent money back to their families and a lot of industries in the eastern colonies exported material to Western Australia. So it not only gave the economy a boost, but it helped to integrate Australia into a common economy and a common market. And that long-term benefit was probably one of the greatest things that happened with the 90s gold rush. One of those to arrive in the West has come further than most. Within a generation, Herbert Hoover will be sitting in the White House. But for now, this 22-year-old mining engineer from Iowa has plans to run the booming gold fields of WA with maximum efficiency for maximum profit. Hoover may not have originated the plan, but Buick Mooring, for whom he worked, were identified with the idea that 
rather than rely on the native Australian prospector with his independent mindedness, it might be sensible to bring in Italian labour or what is now Yugoslav labour, people thought to be more docile and prepared to work for less. This is where Hoover's cheap foreign workers come to. The sons of Gwalia Mine, deep in the West Australian desert. Almost half a century after gold enticed the Chinese, mining and a future American president have sparked a new wave of immigration. The sons of Gorliman had a reputation almost as Little Italy. Very early on, um, really early on, but up to 70% of the, of the workforce were Italian or Slav. Those men would have been living in these hot, dusty, arid, isolated conditions with absolutely no facilities or no comfort whatsoever. The days of the lone digger striking at rich have all but gone. Under Hoover's regime, wages are cut and hours increased. In the battle for the mining money, it's the companies who own the minerals and the wealth now. There were no rich miners. They were eking out a living. I mean, underground miners never make a fortune. And not only do they not make a fortune, but they lose in terms of health and living in fairly primitive outback conditions. It's always in the interests of the mining company to make a profit regardless. The money that they didn't send home, a lot of the men spent it on booze or gambling. Miners saw drinking beer as their right and that the only thing that would cure the dust underground was to come and have a beer after work. You certainly couldn't cure it with water. So for many men, drinking beer after work was what you had to do. Right across the eastern gold fields, alcohol is easier to find than good drinking water. With the tens of thousands of people that were flocking to the field, there just wasn't the water to support them, either for drinking through to basic hygiene. You, mean you couldn't wash your body, for instance. People died of thirst. It was that harsh um, that, that people... Uh, it was not uncommon for people to die of thirst. Water is more precious than gold. But in amongst the despair, there's daring. In 1898, mining is the catalyst for one of the most ambitious and expensive construction schemes in Australia's history. The pipeline is really an extraordinary project. In fact, it fascinated the entire world. Here we have people who are thinking that they can shift water almost 600 kilometres uphill. The plan was that water could be taken from the reliable sources just back of Perth in the Darling Scarp, and a series of pumping stations could carry that water the whole 600 kilometres inland until it got to Coolgardie and Kalgoorlie. Mining is so valuable to the economy that the engineer C.Y. O'Connor is handed the equivalent of the annual state budget to make the plan work. But nothing like this has ever been attempted anywhere before. The pipeline would be a world first. It's, it's a crazy notion in a way, but he did in the back of the envelope stuff. He'd say, right, we've got to move it 550 kilometres. OK, we'll need around about 77,000 barrels of English and German cement. We'll need, well, maybe 60,000 pipes. And we're going to move about, you know, 5 million gallons, around about 20 million litres of fresh water every day. Yeah, look, it's doable. And you can understand, looking at that, that people in West Australia were saying, a scheme of madness. But after five long years, piece by piece, the pipeline comes together. 
until finally on the 24th of January 1903, fresh drinking water arrives in Kalgoorlie. The richest gold fields in the world have been saved and can pour money into the Australian coffers for the next 100 years. Their thirst may be quenched, but the diggers of Kalgoorlie are still ravenous. There's a new kind of rush to grab a share of the mining money. In the heat of the desert, sex sells. Conditions in the gold fields in Western Australia in the 1890s were perfect um, if you were a sex industry um, entrepreneur because you had lots of men there without female company so they're lonely, they're sex starved, they don't have the constraints of family and polite society to inhibit what they want to do. So it's, it's, it's a frontier kind of environment, a bit like the Wild West in America. The promise for them was the same as the promise for the men. They got the gold as well. The earnings that they could make on the gold fields were 14 times at least, sometimes 20 times, what they could have earned if they'd stayed in any other woman's occupation. Local prostitutes are joined by sex workers from across the world who see their chance to claim a share of the mining money. Women from Asia are particularly prevalent. Mining has not only established the red light capital of Australia, but the boom is responsible for the start of an organised criminal industry that will run for decades to come. We're used to thinking about sex trafficking as being something associated with the late 20th century, but this has been going on in Australia for a very long time. The traffic from Japan was fairly well organised. The syndicates were identifying girls, buying them from their families, smuggling them out, shipping them around in a very organised way and profiting from their sexual bondage. From sex to the share market, in good times and bad, mining has infiltrated almost every aspect of Australian life since the 1850s. Ironically, even the greatest economic disaster of the 20th century is good news for this boom and bust business. As Wall Street crashes in 1929 and Australia plummets into depression, the gold fields of WA that have been declining for 25 years make a comeback. Currencies were devaluing everywhere, which actually improved the price of gold in Australian terms. The price of gold actually doubled between 1931 and 1934 to eight pounds, 10 shillings an ounce. So gold mining was suddenly a very attractive industry again. The Golden Mile, the richest square mile of gold bearing ore in the world. If it had not been both for the economic and the psychological boost that the revival of the gold fields gave, the recovery would have been slower and I think the national mood would have been darker. In spite of the new boom, tensions are mounting in the gold mines of Kalgoorlie. The low-paid Yugoslav and Italian immigrants, first brought in by a certain Herbert Hoover, are seen as undercutting the white Aussie miners. Seventy years after Lambing Flat, the battle between different races for a share of the mining money sparks one of the worst riots in Australia's history. It broke out on Australia Day 1934 when a fight erupted at the Home From Home Hotel between an Italian and an Anglo-Australian and the Anglo was knocked over, cracked his head on the concrete floor of the bar and died. And that gave rise to two days of pretty unrestrained anti-Dago rioting, as it was called. Lazar Rodanovich arrived in Kalgoorlie from Yugoslavia in 1901. 
He's worked in the local gold mine for the past 14 years. His 12-year-old son, Peter, watches on as the Aussie miners go on the rampage. A big group came around this hotel and some kid threw a, a, a rock and hit the window and, and, uh, of this hotel and that seemed to be the trigger. Then everybody rushed forward, pillaged everything. So over the road from there, there was an Italian club and then there was an Italian wine saloon a couple of doors away. Then there's an uh, Italian boarding house. They did the same there, pillaged it and then set a light to them. The police came and they told us, you know, get out, get out. We can't protect you. Just, you know, scarper out in the bush or somewhere, wherever you can, because we can't protect you. They're going to come and they're going to burn houses. The Rodanoviches find refuge, but watch on helplessly as the rioters finally reach their home. We could see our street and our house. And uh, when uh, my mother saw the big flame going, she said, oh, there's our house going in. And she, she sort of screamed and just dropped, you know. Uh, and we came back and I saw our house and I uh, looked at it, oh, God, I thought, oh, oh, I thought, you mongrels, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll never forgive you for this. And I haven't ever forgiven them. After two long days of fearsome rioting, three men are dead, 100 buildings destroyed, and 400 Southern Europeans left homeless. The Kalgoorlie riots mark the beginning of the end of the 30s gold boom. It will be 20 years before Australia's next great mineral discovery sparks another battle to share in the wealth of a nation. The days of the new super-rich mining magnate have arrived. It's the start of the wet season of 1952 and a prospector by the name of Lang Hancock is about to make the greatest and richest discovery so far in the history of Australian mining. The legend has it that in November 1952, in the middle of the monsoon, in the middle of the Hammersley Ranges, in the vast Pilbara, Lang Hancock, with his wife Hope in this tiny little aircraft, got stuck and needed to get out. He had to fly below the clouds. And there he sees the gorge walls, iron ore, as far as the eye can see, hundreds of kilometres stretching to the horizon. Lang Hancock had discovered what he would later call his rivers of gold. Hancock can't know it yet, but in the years to come, the Pilbara will open up into a mining area larger than Tasmania and contain 24 billion tonnes of high-grade iron ore. But he is canny enough to sign an extraordinary royalty deal with Rio Tinto. It's a move that will not only change his life, but that of his daughter, Gina. The interesting thing about this contract was, one, it made them instant multi-millionaires. The other thing was that whoever signed that contract forgot to put in a sunset clause. There was no end to it. Gina Reinhardt today is worth $29 billion. She is the richest woman on the planet. And a lot of that money stems from that little deal that was made all those years ago Hancock's discovery lights the blue 